Happy Sabbath. I'd like you all to hold up your Bibles for me so I can see who has a Bible here. Okay, so we have some Bibles. We have some people without Bibles. Today will be a, a unique topic, I'd say. Uh, you won't see too many sermons like this. Um, but how many people, when they read their Bible, do they realize that they have an ancient document in their hand? There has never been a document like this, a book like this, from thousands of years ago that has been translated quite like this book. All over the world. You can look at any other ancient document. You can look up, I'm trying to think of something, whatever the Code of Hammurabi, Hammurabi's Code. You heard about him there in the, in the uh, Fertile Crescent. He had a Code of Laws. That's never been translated like this book. Um, any book from any culture in China, the Middle East, nothing. You could say the Quran. No book has been translated like the Bible. So we are very blessed in this day and age to have a book like this, an ancient book that is from thousands of years ago. As we consider the Bible today, I hope that maybe what we learn here can open our eyes. When we read the Bible, maybe we'll read it differently. Uh, maybe our faith can be strengthened because there are people who are always seeking to undermine the Bible. And if someone comes up to you and brings up something, will, you, will your faith be shaken just because somebody says something about the Bible? Or do you have a baseline understanding about it to where you're not immediately shaken when you hear a couple things here and there? Um, there is an Anglo-Saxon riddle, and it says, Who am I? First I was killed by an enemy, soaked in water, dried in the sun, where I lost all my hair. After that I was stretched out and scraped with a knife blade, folded, and a bird's feather traveled over my surface. Finally I was bound and covered with gild uh, skin, gilded and beautifully decorated. Who am I? I'm the Bible. So this is the Bible of the Middle Ages. This is how you would have a Bible. I was reading in the time of, let's say, uh, just before William Tyndale, maybe John Wycliffe, a Bible was like a church building project. To build a Bible was expensive. They would go into town, even let's say the Catholic churches, the priests would go into town and they would raise money to get a Bible in your church. It was so expensive to make a Bible, and part of it was the process. They would get this leather, they would scrape it out, you just to prepare the pages, and then just to bind it, and then they decorated it. You've all seen these old Bibles. In fact, in the time of Martin Luther and around that time, the Bible was actually chained to the pulpit. It was so valuable. Can you imagine to have your Bible chained to the pulpit? Here, I don't know how many Bibles I have at home. I like to collect things. I got Bibles all over the place, and I don't even open half of them. Back in that time, the whole village may not have a Bible. Maybe only the wealthiest churches. The Bible was a place that only lived in, let's say, the bedroom of a king. Maybe King Charlemagne. Or later on, uh, when you have the King James Version, King James. It was a very special book. You had to be exceedingly wealthy to own a Bible. How about we continue on with our riddle, maybe, maybe 30 years ago. Who am I? First I was felled by an axe, pulped in hot water, pressed was thin a whisker. I was left in a hot room to dry. Next I was pressed with inky steel, some of the, red, uh, some of the letters in red and wrapped in leather. Though I am nothing like I was, I will be precious to someone. Who am I? I'm the Bible. You could say I'm the Bible of 30, 40 years ago. Right? Suddenly, something that a church couldn't afford, a whole town couldn't afford, someone like me growing up, mom and I, we would collect Bibles all the time. I wanted the New Study Bible, I wanted the Red Letter Bible, I wanted any kind of Bible I could get my hands onto because I kind of collected Bibles, I don't know why. <laughs> what can we say today? Who am I? I'm a series of zeros and ones. 
and I am dead without batteries. I speak in swift, but you cannot speak to me. Tap your finger, and I will tell you anything. When I am awake, I emit a blue light that triggers insomnia. You wish your children would put me down at the dinner table. Who am I? Your Bible can be here too, can't it? In fact, the majority of my Bible study, I would say, is on my iPad. Because I have 20 translations on my iPad. And I have all of E.G. White's commentary on my iPad. You know, Dad, a few years ago, you had the Ellen White writings on a disc. Now you can have E.G. White writings on an app that you download for free. You don't even have to pay for it. And the Bible, like I said, is the most translated. Not only is it on the skins. You know, there was many years ago, maybe a decade ago, there was a Bible um, museum that came to, um, came to, what is that castle down there? The Navigator's Castle, Glen Erie, in Colorado Springs. And they had all these old Bibles of all versions, those that were that those were the, were the prepared leather, all decorated, the fancy written copies maybe of the King James Day. And then now we have our Bibles on all of our devices, all over the world, in almost every language. How could such an ancient book come to this point, to where anybody can get their hands on a Bible for free? In fact, there's a translation, uh, the Net Bible, that is... That was purely built for the World Wide Web. It's right there. You can get it printed out, but it was built for the World Wide Web. I would like us all to remember 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though humans, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You know, today, I'm t you know, the topic is on the Bible, but it's really going to be the Old Testament, because I hope not to bore you with a long history of how we got the Old Testament and the New Testament all in one. But I think it's important we realize how much work had to go, how many millions of hands had to touch this book to get it to where it is today, on my phone, for everyone. Anyone can have it. It's truly a miracle. If we look back, when was the Old Testament written? And we'll look in the New Testament later on at another date. But the Old Testament, it, this, the writing started somewhere around 1400 BC. And they don't know exactly where it ended, but the writing of the Old Testament, the last book ever written was Daniel, and there's argument on what date Daniel was finished. But that was around 400 to 200 BC. So that is one book... And if you look at your Old Testament, I want you to open your Bible, just find Matthew. That is the vast majority of your Bible. The vast majority of your Bible. Here's the New Testament, here's the Old Testament. The vast majority of your Bible, it was written over a thousand years, around 1,200 years. How could so many authors bring something like that, that can be put together and read and referenced against each other and agree with each other and still be viable to an ancient person in 1400 BC, just as viable for them as it is for me today. How is that possible? So how was the Bible written? We have prophets, authors, and how uh, books got into the canon. The Jews believed that they were called by God. I couldn't just get up one day, write stuff, and they would get accepted into the canon. The Jews had a very strict way of accepting it. That person had to be called by God. And they would have oral tradition or sermons, and these sermons would be written by scribes, and they would be fashioned and eventually organized into a book. Now, much of these books were written by the original author, but also they were compiled by, let's say, those who work, worked at the schools of the prophets. We hear in, in Elijah's time, and Elisha's time, you had the schools of the prophets. There was a compilation. There was a preservation. There was a transcription of what was written. And, and here is where people can attack us. Thousands of inspired editorial hands were involved in this. 
What if somebody comes up and, you, and says, Tanya, that, that, that book of Moses, you know, Genesis, that wasn't written by Moses. That was edited. Maybe, maybe the Bible, you know, maybe it's not that inspired. All these hands were in there that were other than Moses. And you know what? They're right. There was a lot of editing that happened in the Bible. If you look just at the evolution of, of uh, Hebrew, from 1400, it was a different type of Hebrew that was unintelligible from the Hebrew of around 400 B.C. You had changing in the script. You had addition of vowels that didn't exist before. So the Bible had to be updated as society evolved. I would like you to come with me to Psalm 72. Open your Bibles with me to Psalm 72. Many times we read the Bible and we don't see the, the editor. We don't see the scribe or the, the, one of the sons of the prophets who was writing that Bible down, copying it. We don't see where he has edited the Bible. Psalm 72. And I want you to go to verse 20. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. This was the end of the Psalms. But what happens, just below that in my Bible, I have book 3, Psalm 73 through 89, and it continues. There were times when the light, and so much light was found, and they said, you know what, I think it's the end here. This is the end of, of the Psalms of David. But as time went on, they're like, no, wait a second, we found Psalm 73, we found Psalm 79, Psalms 80. That's not going to prevent them if they believe that this was led by God. That's not going to prevent them from eventually adding it into our Bibles. And when you come to the end of the Psalms, there really aren't any more. But there was a period of time where other godly men, besides David, compiled and found new Psalms and added them into the Bible. But what is very important for us to remember, yes, while there may have been some editing that was always guided by the Holy Spirit. I want you to go with me to uh, Ezekiel 1.1. 1, 1. This is another example where you see an editor here. Let's go to Ezekiel 1. Uh, Ezekiel 1.1. 1, 1. Because, you know, if we don't pay attention to some of these things, someone will bring it up. And suddenly you, you have a crisis of faith. Is my Bible really real? Is my Bible really what God wanted to give me after thousands of years? I like this. Ezekiel. Now it came to pass in the thirteenth year of the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, I, Ezekiel, me, I, was among the captives by the river Chebar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Verse 2, on the fifth day of the month, which was on the fifth year of the king of Jehoiakim's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans. What happened? Ezekiel starts it, he narrates it, and then boom, an editor comes in and, and describes where was Ezekiel when this happened. He saw visions of God, and it goes from first person, I was there, to suddenly... This was the year, this was inserted, etc. Is this part here not written by Ezekiel uninspired? So these are questions people will bring up to you. More examples of how the Bible was edited. You go to Genesis 14, verse 14. And Moses writes that, that um, you can open it now if you want, but Moses writes that this occurs in the place of Dan. In Genesis 14, 14, this is when Abraham pursues the people who took Lot. There was no such thing as Dan. There were no tribes of Israel. But as time went on, an editor said, you know what? I want this to be pertinent to my people today. I want them to know that that when Abraham pursued the enemy, he pursued them as far as this region. And I don't want them to say, 
Laish, which they don't even know. It's been hundreds of years where Laish is. I want them to know that he pursued them as far as where current day Dan is. So there are evidences of some sort of editing. For example, I remember re listening to the audio Bible and I'd say, why would they say, you know, they were, they were admitted as slaves unto this very day? Or you can find this erected unto this very day. It's from an editor putting it into place. Brothers and sisters, how do we rectify this with our Bibles? How do we still agree that there is inspiration even though maybe somebody other than Moses was there or somebody other than, than uh, Elijah was there? And I like this idea here on one side you have the formation of the canon and you have a preliminary canonical form like, like Exodus or Genesis. And it's been copied many, many times from original transcripts. And finally, you have a final canonical form where the books have been arranged in a way that we can look at them today. And this may happen over periods of hundreds of years. All the while, the Holy Spirit is guiding those who put the Bible together. And there comes a point um, in this picture, and it may be a little too small for you to see, around 400 or 200 B.C. that the Bible stops changing. You know, we shouldn't necessarily read the Bible and look up uh, where Dan is in modern-day Israel. You could do that and then insert that in there. Eventually, those who translated the sons of the prophets, when they came to a point around 400 B.C., they said, you know what, I think we found all all the inspired works of David. I think the Psalms are full. I don't think we need to add any more in. And then from that point, there was no changing in the Old Testament. That was the Old Testament you have today. So the Jews of the time of Christ, they had the books of the Bible, and I have them listed here. You had the Torah, you had the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. So the Torah was the law. It was the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It was what we believe were the, uh, the books of Moses. And interesting, in Deuteronomy, there were books written by Moses, or there were chapters written by somebody other than Moses, because they talk about his life after his death. But there was an inspired, there was an inspired writer there. When you have the Nevi'im, these are the prophets. So Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. And then the Ketuvim, or the Ketuvim, I'm probably butchering the words. You have Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Ruth, Esther. Even Daniel was in there from the Jew's standpoint. And their organization, as you can see, if you look at our Old Testament, our Old Testament is organized differently than the, than the Jewish version of the Bible. Because they, they separate it as law, prophets, and then kind of wisdom writings. They called it writings. And you'll have people that argue and they say, you know, there was never a time when we had a, a true canon. When the Jews really had all the correct Bibles accepted. But if you look at the time of Josephus, who lived around the time of Christ, Paul, he says, although such long ages have long gone, no one has dared add anything to them, being the Bible, the words of the Bible, or to take away anything in them, or to change anything in them. So by the time of Christ's birth, the Old Testament had been decided. It had been decided, you know what, these are inspired works of God that we should keep, and you could say autograph, meaning exactly copy word for word and preserve for generations in the future. The canon, you could say, was also con preserved or uh, confirmed by Christ. If you open your Bibles with me to Luke 24, 44 through 45, he says, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law, that's the Torah, and the prophets, uh, which is the Nevi'im, and the Psalms, which was another way for saying the writings, they must be fulfilled. 
So in the words of Christ himself, he himself agreed what the Old Testament canon was. So how did we get this Old Testament canon that we have today in your and my Bibles? At the time of Christ, there were three Bibles. I hope you can sort of see this. There were three versions of the Old Testament. In orange, right up here, you have the Hebrew Samaritan Torah. Now that was a little bit different than what the, the Jews of Christ's time had because it had a little bit of a Samaritan twist. Remember the Samaritan woman at the well? They had a little bit different ideas. So what the Samaritans did is in a couple of places they would turn about where proper worship should be done. They would turn it their way because they didn't have a temple. You have, so Christ is that, is that cross here, right? That's around the time of Christ. You had the Hebrew Old Testament. And then also you had something very interesting. You had, and it's right here in green, you had the Septuagint, which was the Greek Old Testament. And from this point of Christ, there was no change in the canon. There was no change. They all agreed what were the proper books that were inspired. Now something very, very interesting happened because we all know when we read in Great Controversy what happened in AD 70. Does anyone know what happened in, in AD 70 to the Israelites, to the Jews? So we have the destruction of the temple. And I think here is where you see the miracle of the Old Testament, what, what, what God has done to preserve it. Thousands of artifacts, thousands of, of old texts were probably all destroyed in the Old Testament. And pretty much you could say the Hebrew Old Testament was nearly wiped out. So that's why I have this red line for the Hebrew Old Testament, and it kind of ends right here at the destruction of Jerusalem. From that point to a Masoretic tradition, which is where we get our current Old Testament, we have nothing marking that marching or uh, marking those old texts. They all kind of dead end. And around the first century, we have the Council of Jemina, or Jamnia, and that's where the Masoretic tradition began. That's where they started copying the Old Testament as we know it now. Now remember this, uh, this, green, this green one right down here? the Greek Old Testament. It was built around 200 BC and it was named the Septuagint and it was one of the three Bibles during the time of Christ. And if you look, this Greek Old Testament played a huge role in the early church and it played a huge role for those who would be admitted. Uh, first of all, a huge role for those who were scattered abroad at AD 70, because when the Romans came and scattered the Jews abroad, the diaspora, it became a big role there, and then also for the new Christians who were pagans. And why is that? The Septuagint was built for the Greek world. And what happened was Alexander the Great, before the time of Christ, around 336 to 323 B.C., he came and he invaded all of the Middle East there. And with Alexander came his Greek armies and his Greek culture. And Greek became so pervasive in the whole area, it was like English is today. You know, English is the international business language. France used to be that in the 1900s. That's what Greek was in that time. And it got so pervasive that there was a common Greek, a common Greek that Paul spoke, Peter spoke, Andrew, Matthew. In fact, many of them probably couldn't even read Hebrew. They could read Greek. So since this common Greek was spoken in the marketplace, many of the Jews of that time could only speak Greek or only write in Greek if they were literate at all. And um, in Christ's time, when the Romans came and spread them all abroad, the Greek Bible, otherwise known as the Septuagint, it spread to all the then known world. And it's what the early church really had. They didn't have any other Bible. They had the Greek Bible. And what's really, really nice is the Septuagint is the first translation of the Bible we've ever had. And... Um, 
when you look at these old translations, there's the Septuagint, there's a translation of the Bible in Ethiopian, Old Latin and Coptic, they can compare these translations that were written around the time of Christ, and they can compare them to the Masoretic texts, which we use in our Bibles right now, and you can get a deeper understanding or com of, the, of what the Bible of the Old Testament was trying to say. As time goes on, um, the Christians really adopted the Greek Old Testament because many of them were not Hebrew, many of them were pagan by, by background, and they had a good understanding of speaking and reading in Greek. And I'll tell you what, the Greek Old Testament actually influences us to this very day. So I actually have a copy of the Greek Old Testament here. It's the Septuagint in English. And we'll go to Isaiah 7, verse 14. Isaiah 7, 14. And it says here, For because the Lord himself will give you a sign, look, the virgin will conceive in the womb and will bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel. This is the, the Greek Old Testament, a translation of the Greek Old Testament. I want to give you some comparison here. I want us now to read from the Dead Sea Scroll Old Testament. Isaiah 7, 13, and 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. That bracketed area is something lost to time. They found everything but the bracketed area. It was lost. It was damaged. Kind of cool to look at. The Lord will give you a sign. The young woman who has conceived and is bearing a son, and his name will be Emmanuel. Do you see the difference? What does the Greek say? The virgin. What does the Dead Sea Scroll say? The young woman. What does the King James Version say? Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall, his name shall be called Emmanuel. You see what's going on here? There's a little bit of differences between the Greek, between the Masoretic, and you're in my Bible. When the translators went through there, they kind of, they looked and they said, you know what, we kind of like how the Septuagint said this. We're going to say virgin. Whereas in some other translations, they may say, oh, you know what, we'll just say a young woman. But the virgin, a virgin shall conceive, is something that has been ingrained in our Christianity, correct? Small little differences between the Greek Old Testament, between the Hebrew Old Testament, and those come all the way down to our, our time today. The Dead Sea Scrolls is technically the most accurate, a young woman. It's the oldest text we have. But, when you look here, virgin is something that's stuck in our Bibles. Why do I bring this up? In the time of Christ, there were three different Bibles. And there were small little variations in these Bibles. But they seem to pretty much say the same thing. We're going to go look a little bit further. What if someone comes up to you and says, why, your Old Testament has less books than mine. Mine has more books than yours. What's, what's up with that? Did, you, did your forefathers throw out a part of the Bible? And one thing the Septuagint has, if you ever wanted to look at my Septuagint version I have, it has extra books. It has extra books of the Bible. How do we, as modern-day Christians, appro uh, approach this? So, when we look at the books written in the Old and New Testament, there are some things called apocrypha or deuterocanonical canonical books. And I think many times Christians look at these books and they think they're um, heretical. And in many ways, I don't think they are. I think they're mislabeled. The Catholics and the, um, the uh, Orthodox people, they may view this as deuterocanonical or a lesser canon. But mainly all the Protestants, we view this as something that is not inspired. But I still think they're probably important. Here's examples of de deuterocanonical canonical books. And I've highlighted some down here at the very bottom. The Maccabees 
while it is not inspired, if you want to know what happens between your Old Testament and New Testament, if you read the Maccabees, it's amazing the things that happened to the people of God from the time of Ezra and Nehemiah in between that time. What happened in between the books? Well, you read the Maccabees and you learn all about Alexander coming down. You learn all about uh, Antiochus, Epiphanes, how he suppressed the Jews. So it's interesting history, but no, this Deuterocanon, in some of these books, like you would see, like if you ever pick up a, uh, a Catholic Bible or an Orthodox Bible, they may be historically worth reading. But everyone, even at the time of Christ, even the Jews, while they valued these books in the Apocrypha, they never once viewed them as something that has been inspired. It's very interesting because I, I looked back and I, I looked into two theologians, Origen, who was in the first, uh, first couple centuries, and when he moved actually to Galilee, he realized that the Jews of Galilee didn't have the Apocrypha in their Bibles, because you've got to realize Origen, he had the Greek Bible and that had the Apocrypha. Then he goes to Galilee and he sees all the native Jews, they don't have an Apocrypha in there. So he looked into this and he realized that, you know what, maybe some of the books that we thought were canon were not or are not canon. And when, they, when he was able to learn the language and speak with the Jews of the area, he realized that in some ways some of the books that tagged along with the Septuagint didn't necessarily belong or were not exactly viewed as something insp inspired by God. When you had Jerome, around 8300, when he first translated the Old Testament into the Vulgate, which was Latin, he purposely left the Apocrypha out. But then other Catholics in the church put it back in, and it ended up staying in the Vulgate. So there was always an understanding that those books in between the Testaments were not something that was inspired by God, though they could be beneficial in terms of learning what the people were living in that time. I would say if your kid is reading the Apocrypha, it's much better than reading uh, some random you know, book today. There's a whole lot of learning you can do and understand of where, what was the culture like where Christ grew up. So we're going to go back here um, and look at this, at this, this map. Over here I have the destruction of Jerusalem. And the old Hebrew text just vanishes. We have no complete Hebrew text in this area. All we have is the Hebrew, is the Greek, that green line, the Septuagint, going up to this very day. We have two old texts called the Aleppo Codex and the Leningradensis. And they were found around 1000 A.D., so around a thousand years after the time of Christ, those are the oldest, oldest Hebrew documents we have in this Bible. And uh, where do you think those two Hebrew texts came from that are, that are a thousand years past the time of Christ? So they actually came from the Masoretes, the Jewish tradition where they copied and preserved the texts that were lost after the destruction of Jerusalem. So up to 1947, people could say, you have a Bible that's a thousand years beyond the time of Christ. There's no proof. There's no proof that this wasn't made up by the Masoretes. They say it's there. You have a Bible that's a thousand years after the time of Christ. Those are the oldest original manuscripts you have. But what happened in AD 1947, just a little after World War II? Well, let me say this before I talk about that. The... Um, there's only one complete Old Testament, and that is the Leningradensis, which is in Leningrad. The, the Russians have it. It's the only one that's complete. It's from 1008 AD. The other one is the Aleppo Codex, but you know what? It was, destroy it was partially destroyed in a fire. It's actually a better quality, and it was destroyed in a fire, partially. So you could say you have only one text, one text that is making up your Bible, and it's, it's well over a thousand years after Christ. What happens in 1947, uh, 1946 and 47? You have a Bedouin shepherd who is taking care of his sheep 
up among the caves of Qumran. And the caves of Qumran are actually where David was hiding from Saul. That's the area, so you can have some idea. Very desert area, very dry, very arid. And he was trying to find a sheep, and he, he, threw, he would throw rocks into these caves because he would try to scare them out. He didn't want to go into every cave. The caves are everywhere. He would throw the rock in. Hopefully it would scare the sheep, and the sheep would run out of the cave. But he heard something shatter when he threw the rock in there. So he went in to check it out, and he found thousands of ancient documents that we know of today as the Dead Sea Scrolls. And these Dead Sea Scrolls come all the way from 250 to 65 BC. And can you imagine maybe the fear some Christians might have when all they have is the Aleppo Codex, part of that, and the Leningradensis making up their Bibles, and now these new, these new things have been found? What are, what are the archaeologists going to find? Maybe, maybe the Bible has been altered. Maybe the Bible is not the same because this is the oldest version of the Hebrew text. Amidst of the Dead Sea Scrolls, there was also other things, all kinds of extra big, big, biblical books from the culture of that time. But there were whole uh, things, I think the whole, all of Isaiah's there, great portions of the Old Testament. And what did they find? When they matched the Dead Sea Scrolls up to the Septuagint, the, the surviving Hebrew Tanakh from A.D. Uh, 1000, and when they also mentioned up with the, uh, the Samaritan Pentateuch, they found that there was less than 1% difference between the Dead Sea Scrolls, the most, most original, and the Masoretic tradition that had been preserved after the fall of, of uh, Jerusalem. So when you think about that, you think of how the devil works. You even look with the Aleppo Codex, partially burned and destroyed, there's all kinds of miracles that God did to protect this text. Think of all the thousands of people who translated this over and over and over again. And there is not that much change from the very beginning when they find the oldest text that has been sitting and rotting away in a cave somewhere. There is not much change from what you have in your and my Bible today. Maybe it may say a virgin shall conceive versus a young woman, but that will not biblically change your view and your theology. One of the reasons why I kind of like the English Standard Version is if you go to Psalms 145, 13, they actually add in, it's one of, it's the, one of the only versions that adds in parts of the Dead Sea Scrolls, because it's, it's so new. And it says, your kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and your dominions endure throughout all generations. And then this bracketed area is added in, because it says, this is from the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Lord is faithful in all his words, and kind in all his works. That was lost to time. And that's something that we can, again, have restored to us because of what was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, brothers and sisters, I hope that, I hope that this, this little talk, is it very spiritually minded? No. But I hope it can bring us back to how the Lord has preserved his word in the form of the Old Testament. Started around 1400 B.C. All the hands that touched this book the fall of Babylon, the destruction of the first temple, the intertestamental period when Antiochus was coming in profaning the new temple, and then the destruction of the new temple by the Romans in AD 70. There is still not another book that has been translated as much of this in every language. And you know, when you look at how the Jews viewed the Bible, and look now how Muslims how Muslims view the Quran. The Quran, they don't consider it inspired in another language. You have to learn it in the original language to get the inspiration in, the, in a Muslim person's mind. With the Bible, the first translation was the Septuagint. From the very beginning, they were translating from around 200. Around that time of Antiochus, they were translating the Bible in another language. And that, that tradition continues on to today. We have it in Russian, we have it in English, we have it all over the world. And even though the translations might be a little bit different, God's word is still preserved for us today. And we can all be thankful as we consider the value of this ancient text in our hands, that 
that God kept something aside, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, that could be there to do what? To re-verify whenever people start to question, um, whenever they start to ask, is this real? Or is this something that was not made up by the Masoretes around 1000 AD? We have something to verify that yes, this is a miracle in the book that we have now in the palm of our hand. Um, no better way to close this with Isaiah 40, verse 8. It says, The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. So no matter where the world has gone, his word stands forever. And hopefully sometime in the future we can look at the New Testament and we can tie them together and see how God has preserved the New Testament for you and me today.